area it was dark, even though darkness hadn't set in yet. You couldn't see the men three, four feet away from you. Sparks, big as your fist, were flying across the street, just as in a blizzard. Sometimes the winds gusted up to 100 miles an hour. Uh, this fire was uh, different from what we call a group fire. As you know, a conflagration is a fire that has burnt from building to building and block to block uncontrolled. where we're at now is like on the corner of Everett Ave and Spruce Street. And about a block and a half up the street in that general direction to the left of the fire station is where I live. I lived in this apartment house for the past seven years. But I grew up here for the past 24 years in this neighborhood. As before the fire, people lived here for years, for generations, I would say for that matter. And for the past two years before the fire, they were working in this neighborhood to rehabilitate some of the brick buildings and build new housing for the people that lived here. As you might have been living in a fairly, you know, decent house, but you were living next to a junkyard. So a lot of people in the city wrote this area off. Whatever lived here was a part of the junk. In 1800, only a toll road connected Chelsea to Boston. Chelsea was a resort, a small community of country homes. As the Industrial Revolution transformed the Northeast, Chelsea's beaches and waterfronts were bought up by manufacturers. Factories were built. In 1872, a great fire destroyed the commercial center of nearby Boston. The fire brought home the need for fire-resistant construction. As Boston rebuilt, building codes were established and enforced. Among the businesses which were hardest hit by the codes was a small but thriving trade in salvaged goods. The salvage dealers could not meet the standards set by the building codes. Forced to relocate, they went to Chelsea. Developing alongside the factories, the salvage trade bought and sold rags, paper, and scrap metal whatever could be recycled. Many of the salvage dealers were immigrants. Starting as small peddlers, they bought and sold. As they accumulated money, they built wooden sheds to store merchandise. Since these sheds and materials were highly combustible, the salvage trade became a severe fire hazard. Chelsea welcomed the salvage dealers. In its effort to attract industry and commerce, the city was unwilling to restrict commercial practices. The dangers which the rag shops brought with them were ignored. As the factories and rag shops moved in, Chelsea's original families moved out. Chelsea became a commercial and industrial center. By 1908, it was the most thickly populated city for its size in the United States. As Chelsea boomed, its fire potential skyrocketed. The rag district grew rapidly. It was crowded with substandard construction. Businesses, homes, and factories were jammed together. Rags, paper, and other combustibles were piled everywhere. A conflagration seemed almost inevitable. On a Sunday in April 1908, Chelsea burned. The fire began in the rag district and spread rapidly. Eighteen people were killed. Seventeen thousand were left homeless. Altogether, a fifth of the city was destroyed. The Great Fire of 1908 clearly demonstrated the need for building codes and inspections for well-planned streets and zoning laws. 
But instead of instituting needed reforms, Chelsea launched a campaign to attract new industry to the city. Two years after the fire, Chelsea was more congested than before. The rag district was crowded with unsafe wood frame buildings. The rag shops flourished. Chelsea led the nation in loss of property through fire. Almost daily, there were fires in the rag district. The fire department lived with the constant fear of another conflagration. During the Depression, the problem grew more severe as the city cut back on public spending. When the Depression ended and the economy geared up for World War II, these problems were not corrected. In the Rag District, however, profits soared. As wartime shortages became critical, the demand for recycled goods increased. There was money to spend. Tenants purchased homes. Families bought their first cars. In 1952, the Mystic River Bridge was built, connecting Boston with its growing suburbs to the north. The bridge seized Chelsea's prime taxable land. It cut through the very center of the city. Overnight, 1,000 people were forced to relocate. Many young people moved out for good. As they moved out, the pattern of close-knit neighborhoods fell apart. Absentee ownership of homes and businesses caused property to decay. Chelsea's factories were relocated. The salvage trade declined. This area makes up what is, was formerly known as the waste trade capital of the East Coast. Prior to the fire, and for many years uh, since 1908, this has been basically the waste trade warehouse area of the city of Chelsea. It made up the greater number of alarms for many years and increased the frequency of fire in the city of Chelsea. At one time, you could be sure of several multiple alarm fires over the weekend in this area. This section was made up of one, two, three, four-story frame metal clads, and there were heavy fire loads within the buildings. This heavy fire loading contributed to the serious spread of fire on the day of the conflagration. Every inch of space in this area was utilized for storage, especially outside the storage, tires, paper. We had two of the largest waste paper salvage plants on the East Coast and it was not uncommon to find paper packed three stories and four stories high. It's like a thousands of ant mounds. In every one of these yards, there are cranes that look like they're eating at salads of metal and paper, and loading this onto freight cars, this onto trucks, that's coming off. There's 15 trucks going down the street. The streets are all blocked. The racket down here, you know, after a while you walk through, you can't even hear the noise. It's so noisy. And like in the summertime, this dust would be blowing. The papers are blowing all over the place. Gasoline vapors are just everywhere. All it would take is for a spark to set this thing off and boom, it's gone, you know? In 1962, a commission recommended an urban renewal project in the Rag District to eliminate the salvage trade and create a light industrial park. A small community of people who still lived in the Rag District was to be relocated. Yeah, the neighborhood that used to be here was a very strong neighborhood, and everybody that lived here had a sense of belonging. It was the kind of thing where, where someone's family owned a house. They just, you know, passed it down in their family, you know, from one child, say, to another. And you needed help there, right there. Right, right. Even like the store down there, and if you were kind of broke, go down there and say, Gladys, can you let us have a few groceries until Friday, payday or something? Sure. She gave to almost all of us because she knew us since, you know, we were uh, living here almost 12 years. She knew the neighbors, and she was awful good to them. <coughs> I mean, she shared everything, uh, good and yeah. uh, bad, and everyone, everyone shared. Yeah. 
Oh, the tomatoes out of the garden and the kids and Cucumbers. problems. You know, it wasn't... Uh, you're, you're more like cousins and everything, and, you know, more family than you were neighbors. Of the 326 buildings in the district, only six were considered safe by the commission. 302 were condemned. 41% of these buildings housed the rag shops and other businesses. By 1971, when the urban renewal project was approved, the rag district had been written off by insurance companies as a high-risk area. Because of the low water supply and heavy fire loading in the area, the fire department warned of the danger of another conflagration. It was already too late. Sunday, October 14th, was warm and dry. Temperatures reached 70 degrees, and almost no rain had fallen for a month. Winds gusted up to 45 miles an hour. The rag district was almost deserted. It was what forestry men call a class five day, extremely hazardous. Well, on the afternoon of the fire, fortunately, I was at home. Uh, getting prepared to uh, partake of an evening meal. When I heard Box 215 sounded, which is in a bad district as we know it for fires, uh, almost immediately there was successive second and third alarms sounded. Uh, I further heard on the radio before I left the house that the uh, chief wanted all chief officers to report to the scene of the fire. The fire broke out in the rag district. Although people stopped to watch and even photograph the fire, no alarm was sounded until 3.56. Because of the delayed alarm, a well-developed fire was already in progress when Deputy Coyne arrived at 3.58. By 4.01, it had jumped the street. It was spreading rapidly. tried to contain the fire within the two blocks of origin, but high winds drove it through the heavily loaded yards and buildings. To avoid being trapped in the street, Coyne was forced to withdraw his engine companies. The wind pushed the fire rapidly into the heart of the rag district. Deputy Coyne attempted to set up a defense on the corner of Maple and Summer Street, but was almost immediately driven back. The fire was out of control. At 4.12, it jumped Maple Street. At 4.15, it leaped two blocks, forcing the firefighters back. Chief Fothergill called for mutual aid. At 4.20 p.m., 24 minutes after the first alarm had been sounded, he notified the control center that a conflagration was in progress. the fire was raging out of control in a five-block area. The chief ordered Deputy Capistrand to set up a line of defense on Everett Avenue. It was the only street wide enough to act as a fire break. The firefighters directed their heavy streams at the oncoming fire, but strong winds deflected the streams. They never reached the flames.
The firefighters attempted to mount a defense on Everett Avenue. Before they could get fully set up, the fire leaped 150 feet over their heads and ignited the Emerald Auto Works. Men and apparatus continued to pour into Chelsea. The fire had become too large to direct operations from the ground. The chief used a helicopter to get an overview of the city and direct incoming companies to the most critical areas of the fire. The fire was headed straight for the Williams School. Only the wood frame homes on Vale Street and 4th Street stood in its way. The fire spread through backyards and ignited wood frame porches. Within 12 minutes, every building on Vale Street was totally involved. To avoid being trapped, a Medford company was forced to abandon its engine. Along the railroad tracks, a line of heavy streams was set up to contain the fire. From the start, the water supply was inadequate to feed the master streams. A system of hose lines and fire pumps were set up to relay water from over a mile away. At 5.30, the fire surrounded the Engine 5 fire station. Although there were no apparatus available to put it out, the firefighters refused to abandon the station. Heated air rose in a thermal column hundreds of feet high. Fresh air, which the fire needed to sustain itself, was drawn in at ground level, creating 100 mile an hour winds. The high winds drove heavy debris through the streets, endangering men and equipment. Flying brands were lifted by the thermal upcurrent. Carried by the wind, they fell behind the firefighting front. Spot fires ignited and spread. Radiated heat became more intense as the fire grew larger. Buildings 100 feet from the fire were preheated until they reached ignition temperature and spontaneously exploded as it filled with dynamite. Lacking a common radio frequency, the mutual aid companies were unable to communicate with each other directly. To improve communications, the chief established command posts in critical sectors of the fire. Men with portable radios stood by to receive commands on Chelsea's own radio channel and relay them to the responding companies. In 120 minutes, the fire had engulfed 18 city blocks. Only in wartime have firefighters experienced such conditions. While a front was maintained at the railroad tracks, the chief ordered a three-pronged defense set up to narrow the spread of the oncoming fire. By sacrificing several blocks, the firefighters were able to mount a defense in front of the Williams School.
At 6.30, the chief notified Central Fire Alarm from the helicopter that an all-out stand must be made at the Williams School. It was their last chance to stop the fire. Deputy Capistran set up a line of heavy stream apparatus in front of the school. While firefighters with hand lines manned the roof, mobile teams of firemen operated behind the school to extinguish burning brands. During the uh, defense on Arlington Street, many thoughts ran across my mind. At one point, the pumper that was hooked up in front of the auditorium on the Williams School, they wanted to abandon their pump. We had to get a small hose line to uh, wet them down, and you could see the steam coming off their backs. Inside me, I was almost ready to take off down the street with them. I had mixed emotions. There were times I thought that the whole city would be burnt up. My home, all my friends' homes, and so forth. Uh, there was also a thought in my mind that this was the time to uh, take my pension and leave the city. But over the years, the city has been good to me and my family, and I thought that this was the day that they were paying me for. What's the latest condition report you have right now? Well, the condition at this time, we have just received a report that the fire has been contained in the Ward 2 area as of uh, this hour. Thank God for the help of all the out-of-town firemen and our own firemen that the fire will be contained. Within five hours, 1,200 men from 111 fire departments had responded to the call for assistance. Once the fire was contained, many worked through the night. Sparks from the still-burning rag district were carried by the high winds, igniting spot fires throughout the city. It was three days before the fire was finally extinguished. Emergency relief activities were immediately set up by the Red Cross. Donations of food and clothing poured in from surrounding communities to feed and clothe the hundreds who had lost their homes. October 15th, 1973. Dear Mr. President, I am requesting that the city of Chelsea immediately be declared a federal disaster area. The city of Chelsea was swept by a fire yesterday which consumed 18 city blocks, including 200 buildings. Over 1,100 people have been left homeless and 600 left jobless by this disaster. Emergency federal assistance 
is urgently needed. Francis W. Sargent, Governor, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. What about your money? We don't have any now. It's gone. You're bankrupt? I wouldn't say that, no, but it's going to be a problem. Was your home in the area also? No. No. It's going to be a problem from here on. What was it like when you came back to your house this morning? Most of the people want to stay in Chelsea. And, you know, there's no housing. There's no housing available. Chelsea Housing Authority has no units. So we're trying to send them outside the city. But the people don't want to go to Cambridge at some of them. You know, they're old and they have friends and relatives in Chelsea. They have jobs in Chelsea. Some of them have been burnt out and, you know, they, they want to stay in Chelsea. Okay, right, at, right after the fire, <clears throat> a lot of people were asked to relocate out of Chelsea, but they just flatly refused to relocate you know, to other communities that, you know, they were offered housing and everybody wanted to stay in Chelsea so they could be part of rebuilding, you know, their own neighborhood. We were all, and we were more or less all together. We shared our bad, we shared our good. We shared yeah. everything. Right. And it means a lot, you know, for a guy to sit down and you know, talk to his kids, you know, and you say, well, what, what, what do you feel that we should do? You know, I'm going to talk to you. And uh, they all, more or less, I said to them, I said, I can give you your money. Sure, you can go just like the wind. But they said, no, Daddy. They don't want that. <clears throat> what did they want? They, wanted, they all wanted a home. They wanted a home. That's what they wanted. Like we had before. I got blocked. On May 22, 1974, eight months after the conflagration, another major fire broke out in what was left of the Rag District. Two city blocks were destroyed. 200 people lost their jobs. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in property were lost. Once again, Mutual aid from surrounding communities was necessary to contain the fire. Heavy fuel loading, poor construction, and insufficient water supply present constant fire hazards in Chelsea. Wherever these conditions are allowed to exist, local fire departments, however well equipped, will be forced to rely on outside help. Chelsea's fire department is competent and well equipped. But fire departments cannot protect their communities when fire hazards are neglected by businesses, residents, and local government. The conditions which have caused major fires in Chelsea exist in almost every city in the United States. When fire codes are not enforced, unsafe business practices go unchecked. Buildings and property decay. Housing deteriorates. Lives are threatened. Unless adequate safeguards are provided to protect lives and property, great fires will continue to threaten American cities. 